Today we are actually starting a new series here at New Vine Community Church, um, and we're starting a new series on the minor prophets. Um, and not only is this a new series for New Vine, but actually in conjunction with our San Jose Church, uh, across all congregations and church plants, across all language groups, um, Cantonese, Mandarin, English, and then our two church plants, New Vine and New Spring, which is our Mandarin church plant, we're going to be actually unifying all of our messages. And together as a whole church, uh, we'll be covering various aspects of the minor prophets. Uh, this is actually pretty significant because I don't think we've ever done this in recent years uh, where we've kind of synced up all of our messages um, or the themes um, where as a whole church we're going through the series together. So we're praying that it will be a very exciting and fruitful time as we spend the second half of this year um, covering the minor prophets together as a whole church body. Now, um, I say the, the rest of the year because, of course, in the year we're going to have missions conference, we're going to have Thanksgiving, we're going to have Advent. So it doesn't seem as long, but it's probably going to take up the rest of the year. All right. Now, before I want to get into today's passage, I want to ask you, this is kind of like Prophet 101, okay, uh, the class. Uh, what exactly is a prophet? Does anyone know? What's a prophet? I know youth, you're, you're diligently listening, hopefully, and filling out your, your, your sheets. Um, a prophet is someone who gives declarations of God, or more simply put, a spokesperson for God. That's it. Simple. Spokesperson for God. Now, prophets are unique in their background, their calling, and the way they deliver God's message to the people. Now, the one thing they all had in common as a prophet is that they had all been set apart to deliver God's message. So a very important thing. They were God's spokesperson, right? Um, now, contrary to popular belief, prophets don't predict the future, all right? I know sometimes you're thinking, oh, a prophet, you know, they're going to, like, tell me what's going to happen or whatever. Um, but the role of the prophet was not to predict the future. But many of the Old Testament prophets, they did forewarn of upcoming disasters or upcoming blessings. So they did basically tell people, you know, what might happen in the future, okay? But that was not their primary role, all right? Their primary role was really to be a spokesperson for God. Now, there were also other prophets known as court prophets. Um, who were commissioned by the kings of Israel or Judah. And these prophets were also known as false prophets, okay? Because they often spoke what either the king or the people wanted them to hear. Um, and they also did it for kind of unjust gain. Sometimes you would hear about a prophet for hire um, who just, you know, would, would say whatever that you wanted them to say uh, for a price. Now, we see this, these false prophets during Jeremiah's time when the, courts prophet, when the court prophets were actually prophesying peace, but Jeremiah, the true prophet, was actually warning people of impending doom. Now, you may remember that, um, you know, the Old Testament talks about what happens to a false prophet when whatever they say doesn't actually happen you're supposed to stone the false prophet, right? So it's a really heavy responsibility. Not everyone is called to be a prophet. Not everyone should be a prophet. It's really a spokesperson for God. And so there's a heavy mantle, a heavy responsibility uh, to be a prophet. Now, there are actually three components to these prophetic books that we're going to be looking to that actually relate to timing. So it's kind of like a tele an old telescope where you kind of pull it out, and you st stretch it out, and then you pull it back in. And you can kind of see different time frames. Um, the first one is there are immediate implications. So basically specific words for the current situation that the people of God were in. So that's the first thing, immediate implications. And then future implications of a greater event that was going to take place, perhaps an upcoming disaster or perhaps they're going to be taken out to captivity. And then the third timing thing is a final consummation. Way at the end, 
everything being fulfilled according to God's purpose. And basically, it was a message of hope and encouragement and the promise of God's greater deliverance. So three time, timing aspects, immediate, future, and at the end, a final consummation. Now, I'm going to ask you this. What is the distinction between minor prophets and major prophets? You know, when you think of the word minor, you may think that it's describing something that's maybe less important or inferior in size, in degree, or ability. You know, like sports, right? You think of the minor leagues, and then you think of the major leagues. Not that I would know, because I'm not a big sports fan, but I think Lawrence would know, right? Minor leagues versus major leagues. And everyone wants to be in the major leagues, right? No one wants to be in the minor leagues, right? Um, and so, but that's not what we're trying to describe. That's not how the prophets in the Bible are described as. Um, minor, in the, when we refer to prophets, is it has to do with more the length of the book itself um, and their specific content. And so the major prophets are described as major because of the longer lengths of the books, right? Um, so, so for example, um, the major prophets like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, right? These are books that are multiple chapters, like 40, 50 chapters, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, these are all known as the major prophets, okay? Not the heavy hitters, just major prophets because their books are very long, all right? Um, and then the minor prophets of the Bible, they're shorter books, okay, with very specific content um, compared to the books that are maybe 40 or 50 chapters, all right? Now, these minor prophets were just as significant as the major prophets, okay, despite the title of minor. Now, there were 12 minor prophets, okay? Um, do you know, can you name all 12? It's okay, maybe I'll quiz you later after, after the message, okay? Um, and just like the kids, you'll have a prize if you get the answer right, or just like our youth. All right, so not in chronological order, because so the ways that the, it's laid out in Scripture, it there's a certain order, but it, it's not really timing chronological order, okay? So the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Jonah, yeah, you, okay. But the, the Jonah was the one that got swallowed by the whale, right? Or the fish, big fish. Micah, oh yeah, Micah's in here too. Oh my goodness, we got two prophets in here. <laughs> Woo! Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. Oh, we also have Zechariah. Zechariah, where are you? Oh, you're way in the back. Well, we got three minor prophets in here. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even know. You know, in San Jose, I don't think we had any minor prophets to this morning in, in San Jose. But we've got three out of the 12 in here. And then the last one, the Italian prophet, Malachi, or Malachi, okay? All right. So 12 minor prophets, okay? So... Uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. All right? So I'm going to quiz you afterwards, okay? So anyways, as we start the Minor Prophet series, you know, we may not have time to cover all 12, all right? Um, and we may not be able to highlight every chapter or every verse, but there are certain topics that we as a pastoral team really want to cover. And it's really my hope and prayer that in this season, each one of us will actually read some of these minor prophets. Now, I, I say that as an encouragement because they're short books, okay? They're not like 50 chapters, so I'm not asking you to read 50 chapters. But what I am asking you to do is maybe, every, once a, maybe during the week, select one of the 12, read it. And then let's guess which one is going to be the topic for the next week. I'm not going to tell you uh, who, who's going to preach on what. Actually, I don't even know yet. But, but because it's such a short book, I really want to encourage us in the next few weeks, maybe 12 weeks, take a minor prophet and read it. And during that week, ask the Lord, God, what do you, what do you want to say to me as an individual? What do you want to say to us as a church? What do you want to say to us as a community, a body of believers about these minor prophets? All right? So today... Um, I want to start with the book of Habakkuk. Um, now, 
Some people say Habakkuk. Some people say Habakkuk. Okay, I think it's Habakkuk. Um, now, this book is unique in that it's not addressed to the actual nation of Israel, but it's really a dialogue between the prophet Habakkuk and God. All right. So it's really a conversation between the prophet and God. Now, this book is really short. All right. It's only youth. You ready? It's only three chapters. Write that down. Three chapters, okay? And really, it starts off by Habakkuk complaining to God for not judging the wickedness of the people of Judah. Now, this prophet is actually shocked and surprised when God actually answers him. Um, but the way God answers, he basically says that he will be judging the people of Judah through the wicked Babylonians. Okay, now Habakkuk really is kind of shocked with this response, and he asks God a second question. But then, basically, after he receives God's responses, in the third chapter of Habakkuk, he responds with a beautiful confession of faith in this last chapter. Now, again, we're not going to cover the whole book today, um, but I want to point out that the beginning of the book is very different. From the end of the book. In fact, it's vastly different. It starts off with a lot of questioning, but it ends with affirmation. It starts off with a lot of mystery, but it ends with certainty. It starts off with complaining, complaints, but it ends with confidence in the Lord. Now, again, we're not going to have time to go over every verse or every chapter. And even though it's only three chapters, I want to give you a very quick outline.、Um, it's not on the screen, but I just want you to follow along with me. First off, in chapter one, Habakkuk has the first complaint: Why does the evil in Judah go unpunished? Why, God? Why is there so much evil, so much wickedness, and yet you're not doing anything about it? And guess what? God actually answers him. In chapter one, later, which we'll read, and he basically tells Habakkuk that, well, actually, the Babylonians will punish Judah. All right. Now, Habakkuk's second complaint is later in chapter one, and he's basically saying, "What? How could a just God use a wicked nation like Babylon to punish a people more righteous than the Babylonians? Right? How how could God use a wicked nation?" For his purposes, and God's answer in chapter two is say, actually, eventually Babylonia will be punished, and that faith will be rewarded. And then somehow, a lot of things transpire. Habakkuk ponders all of God's answers, and in chapter three, which we won't get to today, this is the cliffhanger part. We'll cover it the next time.、Um, Habakkuk actually has a prayer in chapter three, and he's asking God for、uh, things that he has already seen in the past that he has already seen God do manifestations of God's wrath, but also of His mercy. And he closes the book with this confession of trust and joy in the Lord. This is where the shirt, the 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 the, the, the affirmation, the confidence in the Lord presents itself in chapter three. And that's later in the book, okay? But today I want to focus on the first eleven verses of chapter one. So I'm going to ask all of us to stand up and read this together.、Um, Habakkuk chapter one, verses one through eleven. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received: How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days. That you would not believe, even if you were told, I'm raising up the Babylonians. 
that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, sweeping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, we start off basically by Habakkuk questioning, right? So verses 2 to 4, he's asking the Lord, how long, God, must I call for help? He's actually saying, you're not listening, God. Where are you? And he basically cries out, violence, but you're not saving, right? Why is there so much wickedness? He's perplexed with all the wickedness around him in the land of Judah. There's strife, there's oppression, and it's all rampant in Judah. But God seemingly does nothing about it. God's silent. Habakkuk is crying out to God for an answer as to why God's chosen people are allowed to suffer in their captivity. There's injustice, there's wrongdoing, there's destruction, there's violence, there's strife, there's conflict, the list goes on and on. There's wic the wicked people seem to win, right? And they seem to have a one-up. God, where are you? What is going on? Do you not see? Are you asleep? Are you, are you there? Do you not care? Will you not intervene and do something about it? Brothers and sisters, I wonder sometimes when we feel that way too. When we feel like stuff is going on in our lives and God seems maybe kind of silent. God seems kind of distant. Or it's like, God, look at all the stuff that's going on. Where are you? Well, you're not the only one that has felt that way. Habakkuk, this prophet of God, felt the same way. He was asking God, where are you? What are you doing? Right? Whether it be something that happens at school, whether it be something that happens in our family, whether it be something in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our own personal lives, in our marriage. God, what's going on? Why are you not doing something about it? You know, one thing I appreciate about Habakkuk is he was brutally honest with his feelings, right? He let it kind of, there's no hiding behind what he thought. You exactly knew where he was. He just let God have it in a sense, right? He threw God all these questions, but I feel like there was still some respect and some reverence, right? You know, he basically told God his struggle, his agony, his complaints. He was lamenting to the Lord. He was sharing with him his deepest thoughts. Now, what is it? Now, do you remember other people in Scripture that maybe were brutally honest with God, that also, like, maybe complained or that maybe asked God questions? Right? There were a lot of people in Scripture that did that as well. Like, what comes to mind? So, David, okay, Job, for sure Job, right? A lot of us remember Job, how he was struck with boils and illness, and, you know, his kids died and, and whatnot, and, you know, all, the, you know, all his um, livestock got killed, and the list goes on, right? Isaiah, okay, Jeremiah also lamented. And, you know, there's even a whole book called Lamentations, that's written by the prophet Jeremiah, right? But what does it mean to lament? Well, to lament is to really express grief or sorrow or express deep regret. Now, we can lament through words or actions. Uh, you know, a lot of times people in the Old Testament, they put, uh, they would, would wear, wear uh, sackcloth and they would put ashes on their head. Uh, we lament when we grieve over the loss of someone uh, or something dear to us. We lament in prayer. 
uh, when our hearts are broken. We lament when we feel helpless in our situations. You know, brothers and sisters, I don't know how you grew up as a believer, but sometimes we may have been told, you know, it's not good to, to grumble or good to, not good to complain. I, I get it. You know, we shouldn't grumble. We shouldn't complain. But God is big enough and able to take our laments. God is big enough to be able to take our questions, even our sometimes complaining, okay? But we have to be careful that it's not, we're just not complaining or lamenting for the sake of complaining. It's okay to be honest with God. It's really okay to share with him our deepest pain, our deepest sorrow, our deepest agony, okay? Because God can take it. But what I want to say is, if we have a question for God, we shouldn't just question him just for the sake of questioning him. But we should be ready for God to answer. All right? And also, we should be ready for God to give us an answer that we may or may not be expecting. A lot of times I think when we ask God a question, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I ask God a question or I'm praying for something, I already have a desired outcome. I already want God to answer a certain way, right? Like, I want God to do it my way, right? Because I think I know what's best. But then again, wait, who is God? Is God God or am I God, right? Because it's like, we, I think I know what's best, but maybe sometimes I don't. I think I may know what the answer should be, but perhaps maybe God, when God does answer, he gives us a different answer, and it may not align with what I was hoping for. You know, we need to be ready for God to answer, but we also need to be accepting of what he says. And in fact, he does answer Habakkuk, but guess what? It's not in the way that Habakkuk was expecting. So the first thing that we talked about was basically Habakkuk was honest, was real, he asked God, he complained to the Lord, why? Why Why is there so much injustice? When are you going to answer? When are you going to do something about it? That was the first thing. So as his people, we can also do that. We can also ask the Lord these tough questions, right? But second thing is from verses 2 to 4, right, that was really Habakkuk's question. And then you'll notice that what we just read from verses 5 to 11 that was God's reply to Habakkuk. He gave Habakkuk an answer. And it's actually a long answer, okay? And it's, again, it's not the answer that Habakkuk was expecting. He says in verse 5, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians. And then the scripture goes on and on to ascribe, to describe how evil, how violent the Babylonians were. And actually, God goes into very great detail about how vicious the Babylonians are, okay? And so, but I, I just want to focus on verses 5 and the beginning of verse 6, okay? And Habakkuk's like, what? Like, wait. You're going to use who? You're going to use these wicked people to, to, to stop the injustice in Judah? Like, it makes no sense. How could you, a holy God, use a sinful nation like Babylon as a source of your judgment for your own people? How could this be? It made no sense to Habakkuk. This answer that God gave totally, like, blew Habakkuk's mind away. Maybe perhaps Habakkuk was hoping that God would himself deal with the people of Judah and not through a wicked nation like Babylon. He had a certain outcome in mind, but that wasn't the answer that God gave him. He was not prepared for God's answer. And God, again, in verse 5 says, For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. So even when God answers us, are we ready for his answer, 
right? Because I think a lot of times we're not ready. Because a lot of times we want God to answer a certain way. A lot of times we have already a preset notion of how we expect God to answer. But you know what? A lot of times God doesn't work in the way we want him to work or think that he should work. Because in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 9, it says, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. His ways are actually higher than ours, and his thoughts are actually higher than our thoughts. A lot of times as his people, we think we know what's best for us. But if we say that we're God's people, if we say that we are the clay and he is the potter, if we say that we are his child and he is our father, then wouldn't the potter and the father knows what's best and what's right for us? Habakkuk wasn't happy with the answer. In fact, he was actually more perplexed. He was scratching his head, and he threw God another question, which we're not going to have time to go into today. But he was honest. He was bold. But really what I want to say is, if we ask God a question, we have to be ready for God to answer. And he will answer in time. It may not be today. It might be tomorrow, okay? But if we ask God a question, he actually will answer. But it may, again, not be the answer that we may be expecting or wanting, all right? Now, I'm going to go back to verse 5 because I, 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 I actually love verse 5. I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Okay, actually, the beginning of it says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, right? So he tells Habakkuk to what does he tell him to do? To look, to watch, to be alert, right? To be scanning, like, okay, what, what is happening, God? Um, to not be blindsided, to not have his eyes closed, but to be expecting God to move, to be utterly amazed because something's about to happen. God is about to do something. Are we ready for God to do something? And he actually tells Habakkuk, I'm going to do something in your days that even if I told you, you wouldn't even believe it because it's going to be kind of crazy, right? Do you want God to do something amazing in your situation? Brothers and sisters, perhaps you've come here today with some questions for the Lord. Perhaps there's some problem. Perhaps there's some circumstance. Perhaps there's some injustice that you feel like you're in. Perhaps you feel like, God, something is not right. And why are you just letting me suffer through this? Why are you letting me suffer in agony? Why aren't you doing something about it? It's okay. You can continue to ask God that question. But do you want something? Do you want God to answer you? And do you want God to do something amazing? like he's telling Habakkuk. Actually, God has got this issue that you're going through right now. The question is really, do you trust him enough? Do you really trust in his sovereignty that your father knows the answer, that you're the potter that is molding you as you surrender to him is sovereign and that his ways are higher than your ways and that his thoughts are not your thoughts. Are you able to completely depend and trust in him today to know that God is desiring to do something that even if he told you, you wouldn't believe? You know, the first time I remember these verses having an impact in my life was um, back when I was in college. Um, you know, when I when I went to I went to Davis. Uh, most of you know that, but I you know I, not too far away. But every you know between Christmas and New Year's, there's always like a winter break, right? So you know, usually it's two or three weeks off, and and so I would come home every winter, you know. But then, even though it's a two week or three week break, I would always want to do something. So like the first time I was home for for winter break, I went to Mexico on a short term missions trip. The second year I came back, I went to like a winter conference, like a retreat. And and every year there would be something during that break. And I would be happy because I wanted to go. But my mom, on the other hand, 
wouldn't be happy because I think from a mother's perspective, it's like you're only home for two weeks or three weeks and you're going to be gone for most of it, right? And so, right, as a mom, Jessica, you would agree, right? Okay, but as a kid, I'm like, no, I want to be with my friends. I want to do this. I want to do that. And so, so you know, so, so but every, every winter break, I would want to do my own thing. I would want to, like, be off with my friends or, you know, be here, be there. But from a mom's perspective, she was like, what are you doing? Like, you know, mom wants your son to be home, right? And so, so there was one year that um, I, again, again, every winter I was gone, all right? Full confession. I don't think I ever confessed to my mom, but maybe I will after this. Um, there was one year, um, I'm going to date myself. In 1993, I wanted to go to Urbana, all right? And I think most of you knew, know, some of you know what Urbana is. It's like in Urbana, um, Illinois, or it was in Urbana, Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Um, and it's like a huge missions conference that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship puts on. And so I really wanted to go to Urbana because it was cool. It was like the thing to do. And, um, but my mom didn't want me to go. All right. But I still went. Okay. And that was probably the first, well, I don't, I shouldn't say the first time. That was one of the, can I say a few times? Do you think I can say a few times? Maybe not a few times. That was one of the times that I kind of went against my mom's wishes. Okay, I'm usually a pretty good boy, like a pretty good son, usually, okay? But there are some things that I will just like be very strong. Eric, you would say principled, right? I would be very principled, not stubborn, not strong-willed, but like Eric would say, principled. I'd be very principled about, no, I'm going to Urbana. And so as a result, my mom and I had this rift. Because she really did not want me to go, you know. And, and actually, I went with this attitude of, I'm just going to go because I feel like God calling me to go. And I went with this bad attitude against my mother, Jessica, I, I know, you know. So as a mother, okay, like I just felt like, forget my mom. I'm just going to go, all right. Like literally, I felt that way. I'm not going to listen to my mom. I'm just going to go. I'm going to listen to what I thought was God calling me to go. Um, and it may have been. Um, and so, but basically, we had a strained relationship, all right. I think she wasn't even talking to me at that point, all right. And so, um, at Urbana, I felt God calling me, all right, to missions. And, and I surrendered my life to say yes and all that good stuff. And, 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 you know, I met one of the missionaries that spoke at our church, and I shared with him. I was like, yeah, God's giving me a call to missions, blah, 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 blah. And, okay, this is, a, this is like, um, you know, he's an Anglo missionary that served among the Chinese. So he's very Chinese thinking, right? So he was like, you know, it's really good or very Asian thinking. And he said, it's really good that God gave you a call to missions. And he said something that I never would have expected from his mouth. He said, but. God also gave you an obligation to your mom. And I was like, what? I was shocked. That was not the answer I was expecting to hear. Like completely shocked. Because I thought he was going to say, oh yeah, you go. God will take care of your mom. You go do missions. You do whatever you think God wants you to do. But no. He basically said, it's great that you have a call to missions. It's great that you want to serve the Lord. But God also gave you an obligation to your mom. And so you, some of you know that I, I'm the only child. I'm widow. I mean, mom, I'm, I'm, I'm not. My mom is widowed. <laughs> oh, reject that. <laughs> um, my mom is widowed. You know, so like I grew up without a father. And, you know, immigrant family, sob story. You know, they work, she worked so hard to get me here, to give me an education. Why would you, you know, why would you do this, right? And so anyways, so I was shocked, okay? But it was during this time that God brought these verses to my mind. Somehow I was reading the book of Habakkuk, okay? And basically, these, you know, he's like complaining. So I'm like, well, God, like, okay, I wasn't really complaining, but I was kind of like being honest with God. Like, God, I don't get this. I don't get the situation. Here you are, like, supposedly calling me, giving me a heart for this and that. But yet, I've got this not enemy, okay? But I've got this problem, right? I've got this mother who's like, against everything that you want me to do, what's the answer? Like, I don't know what to do. And then this, this, this tall missionary says, 
guess what? You've got this obligation to your mom. That was not the answer I was expecting. That was not the answer I was looking for. I was like, God, what? Like, that doesn't make sense, right? And so the verse that I really clung to that God really impressed upon my heart was verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Okay, now to me, what that meant was, I don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I kind of felt like, okay, God, if you says look at the nations, okay, maybe I'm going to look. Maybe I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to believe. I'm going to trust. I'm going to surrender. Like, I really didn't know how this was all going to work out or how it was all going to pan out. But, but basically what happened is after Urbana, I came back home and I felt like, I felt repentant. I felt like, oh, I cannot have this forget about my mom attitude. I came back from Urbana with a burden for my mom, with a, a desire to pray for my mom, with a desire to minister to my mom, to basically say, you know, mom, you're important to me. You know, I'm your son. You're important to me. You matter. I love you. I want to, you know, do what God wants me to do, but I also want to, to be a good son. Because basically, I was just going to, like, forget it, you know? And so, you know, I graduated from school from Davis, um, and, you know, I came back, and I, uh, I graduated. I started working, and then I started thinking, oh, you know, the whole missions thing, I'm going to start taking graduate school classes at Simpson. And so I started doing that, and then after a while, well, actually, Susan, you and I were taking classes together back then. Um, back then, my mom basically got wind of it, and she got really upset. Right? So again, opposition, I felt. Obstacle, right? Like, whoa, like, what do I do? So I kind of backed off. You know, I'm really, I'm actually a very fearful person. So I was really afraid of my mom because I didn't want her to give me the silent treatment again. I didn't want to dishonor her again. I just felt so like, oh, sorry. I mean, not, I mean, yeah, sort of. But I, I basically backed off, right? And so this whole like missions thing that was kind of like, Call, on God, call of God in my life. It's kind of like back burner, you know. Like, you know, I would serve in the church and I served along with a lot of you in the church for many, many, many years, right? And what was interesting is that I still felt an openness to what God wanted me to do. And, um, you know, even one Sunday in our San Jose church, like one of the elders prayed for me and I was just like, I think, you know, it was one of the services where, you know, you could come up for prayer. And I really felt this calling from the Lord. And, you know, he even said the word shepherd over me. And, and I was just like, yeah, this is, you know, I think I feel that this is what God wants me to do, blah, blah, blah. Um, but nothing ever happened, okay, until 2015 when Pastor Ted and Sandy invited us to her, his, their home and kind of like had a talk with us and kind of invited us to start praying. No, I, I, I promise there's a point to this story. I know it's very long. But, but basically, what I want to share with you is that I didn't know what was going to happen, okay? But I clung to this promise that God says, watch me do something. I was really fearful of my mom's reaction to ministry, right? But I felt like after... In 2015, I felt like I really had to bite the bullet and really face my fears. It was really my fears. It was my fears and really not um, what God was doing. God was already working. God's been moving. But it was really, I felt like I let my fear stand in the way, right? And so basically, I bit the bullet. I told my parent, my mom, told her parents, and it was ugly, but it was okay because God was there. It was hard. It was painful. There was some silent treatment, but it's okay. I think as a as a you know married guy in my I guess I was in my forties with three young kid with three kids you know and and having had a career in industry it was different than when I was just graduating from college, right? And I really felt that looking back now, God really worked it out. It took 24 years, but God worked it out. 
Back then, I didn't know how God was going to work it out. I didn't know what he was going to do. But this verse about look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, I'm utterly amazed looking back now because, you know, my mom has accepted the fact that I'm in full-time ministry, you know, and I've never asked her how she feels, but she's, she's really accepted the fact, right? She lives with us, and so I guess she has no choice. But you know, but the, the fact is, like, I, I think I'm just totally amazed at how God has worked. Like, if you would have, have told me this back then, I would not have believed it, right? Because I couldn't see how God was going to move. But looking back now, it's like, oh, wow, God, You had it planned all along. You were sovereign. You were in control. You were providing. You were opening doors. And I feel like with these 24 years, I have learned so much about fear, about stepping out in faith, about just really clinging to God, holding on to his promises, right? And to just really saying, God, being honest with him, I don't know how it's going to work out, right? But as we are open and honest to the Lord, he's inviting us to look. He's inviting us to watch. He is inviting us to anticipate, to be utterly amazed at what he will do. It may take a couple days. It may take a couple years. It may take 24 years. But God is true to answering us if we're courageous enough to ask the question. Don't lose hope, brothers and sisters, because God will answer. The question is, are we ready to receive God's answer? And are we ready to to just say, God, I know I have an inkling of what I want the answer to be, but as your child, I'm willing to trust you that you know best. I'm willing to say, because your thoughts are not my thoughts, because your ways are higher than my ways, I'm willing to submit and surrender and ask you to continue to provide and lead. God is sovereign. He's omnipotent. He's got this. He has all things under, your control, under his control. Whatever situation that you or I may be in today, whatever complaint, whatever thing that we have, you know, that's in front of us, he has it under control already. We just need to be able to trust him. Do we have that faith to trust him? Brothers and sisters, I don't know what your situation is today. I don't know if you're going through a period of injustice or you're facing some, something in your life. It's okay to lament. It's okay to ask God. It's okay to complain. Really, tell him. I want to encourage you to lay it all out. Be honest to the Lord. He's big enough to handle it. You can go ahead and question him, but again, Be ready for his answer, because his answer may not come today. His answer may come tomorrow. But also, his answer may not be what you want it to be or what you're expecting. But are you able to trust him for that answer? Are you able to look, to watch, to be utterly amazed that he will do something, maybe not in the timing that you want? So I just want to encourage you to keep trusting in him, to keep asking the Lord for whatever it is that is on your heart. I'm going to invite the worship team to close us with a song, and then we will end our time together today. Jesus, we come before you today. In this intimate moment, Jesus, we want to sit at your feet. God, we want to pour out to you our heart's cry. Lord, for those of us that may have any questions, that may have any complaints, Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be real, to be honest with you tonight. Father, we ask, God, that even as we pour 
our laments, even as we pour our questions to you. Father, we ask, God, that you would come and that you would give us the courage to hear your answer, that you would come, that you would speak to your people today. Father, we know, God, that your answer could be instantaneous, but sometimes your answer may require some patience. So, Father, no matter what it is, if it's instantaneous, if it's right now, or if it's tomorrow, if it's the next week, if it's the next year, Father, we ask, God, that you would allow us to trust you, allow us to surrender, to submit, to say, Jesus, you are our Father, you are our Heavenly Father, God, that you are the potter and we are your clay, we are your sons and your daughters, and we submit to you to whatever answer you desire to give us. We acknowledge you as the sovereign one. We acknowledge you as the God who is in control. So Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to answer us, that you would help us to keep watch, to look, to be expectant of you to work in our lives, for to be expectant, Lord, of you to tell us things that we would not even believe, Lord, that we would be utterly amazed. God, that you would surprise us, Lord, that you would answer in ways that we would have no idea and no clue. But God, that we would be able to testify of your goodness in answering our heart's cries tonight. So God, we ask that you would do that for each one of your people here at New Vine Community Church. Whatever it is, you know. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? God, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to hear our prayers and our cries tonight, even as we go from here, even as we dismiss. Lord, that Jesus, you would be with us, that you would be with your people today. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. We honor you, and we say hallelujah for your love. Hallelujah for your presence today. Thank you, Jesus, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.